Human centric, human central. And I'm up. All right. Everyone have a good conference? Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah, this is, I love, freaking love Converge. And I'm really glad you guys stuck around for the last talk of the day and hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, this talk is on, on design. My name is Wolf Gorlick. Uh, I've been digging into this concept because one of the things that's been bothering me um, from, a, from a CISO perspective, from a director perspective, from a manager perspective, we got a gazillion security things we have to do. And knowing which one to do when and why and how is always a struggle, right? Do I start here or do I start there? Do I, do I put in place uh, segmentation or do I put in place VPN? Should I have a strong perimeter or should I have a weak perimeter? Should I move everything to the cloud or should I, you know, and trying to make sense of what we should do is, is always a challenge. So that's why for the past uh, couple months I've been focusing very heavily on design. And the next series of talks I'm going to be giving is all around this concept, design and art and how it all plays as a CISO. Uh, I am an advisory CISO, I'm an advisory CISO with Duo, so uh, thank you Duo for sponsoring. If you haven't said hi to them, please do. Uh, great organization. I've been there with about a month now, so I'm absolutely loving it. I also spend way too much time on Twitter, right? I always have. Um, and so I want to start off with a tale of two tweets. One is, on the internet nobody knows your dog. Anyone remember this old comic? On the internet nobody knows your dog. We were arguing about uh, privacy on Twitter. I'm like, man, it's 25 years later. Now on the internet, we know the breed, we know the location, we know how their education, probably their uh, income, and what chew toys to sell to them. I mean, the privacy is, is just insane. So I, th I threw this up. I thought it was funny. I threw this up on Monday. Later on, on Tuesday, I threw this one up about SHA-1, right? SHA-1 collision attacks uh, are now <laughs> so freaking easy. You can download a script. You say, hey, I want this hash to match that hash. You run a script. Bada boom, bada bing, SHA-1 is absolutely positively broken. One of these has value from a security perspective. One of them doesn't. And I went and I checked the stats this morning because I really was writing these slides as I was flying in. And I checked the stats, and it's the funny one got 298,000 views, and the SHA-1 got 5,000 views. Like, ah. Oh, nobody freaking cares about security. The yes. That's funny, right? We'll, we'll, we'll retreat the one 30,000 times, 300,000 times. And this happens to be again and again and again. If I put something on that my wife said was really cute or was sassy, everyone watches that. I'm like, preparation is important in cybersecurity. You shouldn't just do prevention detection. One fave. Like, Ten people viewed it. I'm like, ah. No one cares about security. And this is something that I struggle with all the time. And, of course, it's, it's a problem because... Um, effectively, we ask our users and our community to juggle chainsaws, don't we? I mean, we trust people in our organization to juggle chainsaws, and that creates some really fascinating, challenging security problems. Obviously, security happens uh, when mankind meets the machine. That's where the security happens. That moment where we touch the machine, there's a security decision being made there. And, of course, it oftentimes goes wrong. Anyone watch uh, Sam's talk earlier on the phishing? Frickin' awesome talk. Awesome talk. And the types of things I love about coming to Converge and hearing real-world practical advice. And, obviously, we hear all the time about how rampant phishing is and how much gets lost. There's an organization called the IC3, uh, which uh, is uh, responsible for collecting and investigating Internet crime. And business email compromise, phishing the business email compromise, the losses from that was $1.2 billion, billion with a B, billion dollars last year. Insane, insane. So anytime you can do a phishing campaign, of course, we're doing pretty good. But it happens the moment the user touches the computer. Uh, similarly, there's the paywall diversion, uh, payroll diversion scams, where they're like, oh, pay this person that thing. And that's like another $100 million just leaking out because someone's payroll got compromised. Obviously, users are a problem. But we oftentimes pick on users because they're easy. We pick on users. And they're like, oh, if only people stop clicking on stuff. But of course, <laughs> it gets worse than that because software developers are writing code all the time. And are they doing it in a secure way? Maybe. Maybe. We hope so. Maybe. Um, probably not. And at the same time, we've got, uh, hey, come on in. I was just telling that all the tweets I'd say about you are always the one that everyone likes. 
Now you're caught up. And now we also have IT professionals, right? So IT professionals who are standing up servers and services and infrastructure in a secure way? Probably not. <laughs> in a safe way? No. Um, but we're relying on them, right? Especially in a day and age now where everyone is usually spinning something up in the cloud, probably hasn't checked with security anyways. It's in an Amazon instance that we had no idea about. Or worse, we find out we're on Azure. <sighs> it happens, right? I locked down our Amazon environment. Good. We just won't tell you about Azure. Um, and of course, that's just like infrastructure as a service. That's not even taking into account software as a service and everything else. And how many breaches did we have this past year from S3 buckets? Some of us, S3 bucket open and didn't check or didn't know. Uh, I've got a, a uh, friend, client, and colleague who actually wrote a script just to scan his environment for S3 buckets just because he got sick of that happening. And he's still, even though there's been education, there's been conversation, we've had culture, folks. There is a culture of security. Still finds S3 buckets all the time that they spun up and are open to everything. So we know this happens all the time. You know, errors according to the Verizon Data Breach Report, which was recently released, account for 21% of the breaches. Someone did something wrong. Mankind makes mistakes. Mankind touches the machine. That's where security happens. And that led me to start trying to figure out how we could re-envision security around the human concept. We know this about communication. We say this all the time, right? Communication is not what we say, it's what they hear, right? As managers, as spouses, as good human beings, we try and absorb this and remember. It's not what we said, it's what they heard. I would argue that InfoSec security is not what we control, it's ultimately what they do. What they do with the environment and experiences we set up. Therefore, my whole point of this entire talk is to convince you guys all that, hey, design thinking is cool. And design thinking will be a great way to start thinking about how we can design better experiences for our users, for our folks. I'm going to cover in three different ways. I'm going to cover usability. I'm going to cover manageability. I'm going to cover defensibility. I'm going to wrap it up. We'll get you all to closing comments. And I'm going to do so hopefully without coughing or falling asleep. So that, that is my promise to you with my big tub of uh, espresso here. So let's start with usability. <clears throat> usability, obviously, is is designing for users, right? Designing for the folks who, who uh, are doing things. A while ago, and I know I'm going off camera, so I'm sorry. A while ago, I was doing an audit, right? So I used to do audits and do assessments. And I was given an RSA token. I love these RSA tokens, right? You get the little physical token, here's your two of that. This is great. And they said, okay, we're gonna protect our audit incentives. Like, all right, how do I do that? They're like, you gotta use this VPN. And it was only slightly more modern than this display. This was probably the oldest VPN I've ever, ever seen. It was like antiquated, barely worked, and you put in your username and password, and then you put in a variation of the first four characters of your password, which concerned me, because if you knew the first four characters of your password, it doesn't seem hashed to me. Does it to you guys? I don't think so. But you do the first four characters plus the code on your RSA token. And then, third time, sometimes, it would tell you you put your password in wrong, usually, because I was hurrying, and sometimes you'd have to re-enter just the RSA token because you put it in right and for whatever reason the firewall wanted it to. And I get a great message like that. That was step one, to get on the network. Step two was everyone had a unique one of these. We now had to go to the command prompt and net use to the drive where the folder was using a shared credential for my then employer where we were getting the network evidence. And then we'd pop up that network evidence where throughout the assessment they would periodically go, what file were we using? Oh, I'm sorry, we just overwrote that one. That's not the right version. That's why your, your audit's wrong. Ah! And I'm a security professional. Now, I had about you know, 30 other accounts at the time, but I'm a security professional. I'm a technical person. I know how to do all this. Why am I doing this every single time? It was terrible. It was fundamentally terrible. And I think as security professionals, we forget, yes, it's a great idea to have a VPN. And multi-factor, yes, I believe in multi-factor. And yes, we should have shared folders that are protected. Yes, but are we thinking about the experience that we're giving to our users, an experience that we're asking people to, uh, to go through to make anything happen? You guys all know William Gibson, right, of the, of the famous Hack the Gibson, the Hackers movie? I realized the other day the Hackers movie came out when my career started, and I used to think that was cool. Like, yeah, Hackers came out when my career started, and we could, like, rollerblade in the data center. And I'm like, oh, my God, that was way too long ago. All right, so William Gibson, of course, 
guy who the Gibson was named after, had this quote, the street finds its own use for things. What's fascinating is whenever we do not take usability into mind, whenever we do not take usability into account, what do people do? They find their own use for things. They find their own way to do things. They find their own workarounds. They do all the sort of things that give us heartburn and keep us up late at night and cause us to drink. <laughs> Seriously, though, um, I like to say that my, my risk appetite, you know, what's your risk appetite? My risk appetite is bourbon. I mean, at that point in time, because, ah, users. But they do life hacking. They do work hacking. And why is that? Creative constraints is the answer for that. If you guys haven't looked at creative constraints, highly recommend you do so. It's a fascinating field. The basic theory is this. The more constraints you put, the more creative people are, which really explains why the tighter the environment is, the more likely people are to put it on a thumb drive, copy it down, take screenshots, do other crazy stuff to work around it. We create the demon of our own making in this situation. Um, so one of the areas I've been studying for this is human-centered design. Human-centered design is about taking into account the psychology, not just the technology. It's about being empathetic, which is sometimes very hard for us. We just want them to do what we ask them to do. Uh, it's about being kind. It's about being kinder than necessary to the experience that we're asking these folks to do every day in and day out. And on the one hand, it seems kind of soft and touchy-feely. On the other hand, if you take into account creative constraints, I would argue that it actually makes our environments more secure. So human-centric design has some design principles. Contrast, right, how the variance of different uh, activities or different displays look, proportion, how they're aligned, proximity, that things are close together, human mind is, they must be related. Uh, what the pattern is of behavior, how is it unified, how is it aligned with how you think and how you act, and this movement is a repeatable movement that you can build intuition about and build skills around so that when you do things, it behaves in a normal way. Very, very fascinating. Now you're thinking, okay, that's cool, but what about security control? I really just want to lock my users down. Um, part of it is, is the pattern side, right? You guys may have heard me say many times that when work looks like work, work gets done. If a user sees something and it looks like normal work, they're going to do it. Hey, great, awesome. If it looks confusing, if it looks a little different, if it looks a little odd, they're going to get creative. We don't want them to be creative. <laughs> we want to take the work out of it. So the concept of pattern, right, using pattern for usability so that people always log in the same way. So there's a similar experience when they're connecting up remotely to when they're connecting up internally. So that when they're working at the coffee shop versus when they're working at home, that you have the same pattern. When you're doing um, development, that the SDLC has a defined pattern that we know when we're going to check code and when the uh, pen testers are going to test it. Right, that you have that repeatable process. That concept of pattern becomes very, very important because it ingrains in people that this is just how things work. And if it's repeatable and it always behaves the way they predict, then they're going to follow it. The other concept is movement, which is this idea that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of work for work not to feel like work. This is an area where CISOs and CIOs have to spend a lot of time to make things empathetic, to make things in a way that uh, is intuitive and reduces cognitive load. It takes a lot of work to remove the friction out of those systems. But in doing so, again, we make it easier. And then you pattern that with movement so it's something they predict. They can go ahead and follow it. You know, the best systems only work when people do not have to work very hard to make them work, if that makes sense. So as a contrast to my other example, um, I had another client, and I love these clients. This is right after the one with all the funky VPN. I'm like, the, we prefer to use our own system for audit information. Like, oh, I need another token. I know this is how I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah, it's Box. I'm like, yes, score. How do I get to Box? Like, it's simple. You know the MFA you're using? Just use that. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I want to hug you guys. And, oh, by the way, we got version control turned on, so if we make any mistakes, you can, like, to see what versions we have so we can, like, <gasps> I wanted to hug them after this thing. I still gave them a terrible audit because I'm a mean guy. I mean, they had problems. They had problems, right? You got to still hold people accountable. But it was great. And it was an area where, when you compare it to the other things, the other environment was very quick, very intuitive, and I was able to go ahead and follow a pattern and practice. It was very simple to me. I go to Box all the time. I go to Drop all the time, right? Very, very simple. Another example of this concept comes from uh, a friend of mine in the federal space, and um, she was working on FedRAMP. I was doing a project, maybe you guys caught a couple of my talks in this, it was securing without slowing. 
the premise I was trying to find out was what organizations have introduced security without slowing down the user experience? Preferably made it quicker. Shockingly, the answer was very few. <laughs> I'm like, who's done this? And everyone sitting on their hands. I'm like, someone has had to have done this. And it took me forever to get any like, good examples. And then finding people like, all right, I kind of started to, I'm like, yes, tell me what you did. And this was one example from a friend of mine in the federal government space. FedRAMP is a standard. Does anyone know what FedRAMP is? Where are we at? So a couple people do. All right, so basically, if you think about NIST, it's a whole bunch of NIST controls applied to um, a federal program where you're running an application in the cloud for the federal government. Make sense? And you've got to do code freezes and continuous monitoring and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it's fantastic, and it's hard, and it's secure. Great. Now, she was responsible for running FedRAMP and doing internal audits for a whole bunch of Gov apps. And every single time they would do a Gov app, they would check it, and she'd go, you missed a whole bunch of stuff, and they'd check it again. Yeah, you still missed a bunch of stuff, but the res a little bit less. They'd check it a third time. Okay, now you're getting closer. And these types of assessments would oftentimes go one to two years. And she made the realization that, hey, a lot of these things that we're finding are the same issues. People have the same pattern of work. People who follow the same movement to create FedRAMP apps. So she pulled her top people, pulled them out, did a Skunk Works project for three months. Three months later, they came out with templates and said, hey, if you want to be FedRAMP certified quicker, here's all the templates you need. And by following these templates, people would cut it from two years down to three to six months. Because already all the controls were there, already all the processes were there, they could spin up images, everything was hardened and ready and whatnot. I love that. I love that idea that they were able to actually make things much more quick and speedy and reduce time to market for all these FedRAMP applications by having to find templates and thinking about security ahead of time and working with the way these folks worked. Really freaking cool story. So the overall idea is we want to design for usability, right? And we want to do so in a way that is easier for the users to work. So if they get fished, hopefully, you know, MFA is kicking on so they don't do anything wrong. If their, um, you know, financial compromise happens, hey, please transfer me a gazillion dollars. And they go, okay, my guy, it's the CEO, and he clearly needs a gazillion dollars. I'm going to click send. Then hopefully there's a process that the bank goes, well, wait a minute. We need a two-person validation. We want to have these patterns so that when people are writing code, they start with code that is from templates that are already secure, or building systems are starting from systems that are already secure, that we've got the way that we can reduce friction and effort across the systems that people are using. Point number one. Point number two is all about defensibility. So how can we build systems that are defensible, right? How can we build systems that are designed for the criminal element? How can we build systems that prevent people from you know, taking advantage of them, right? That, were, that are protected. And, uh, and this gets to what I used to call my, my free pen test. So some of you guys already know the story if you've been around MySec for a while. Um, B-Sides Detroit, 2011, we stepped out and uh, afterwards we were all excited. There was a panel and Doug Song was like, we need to make this a regular part of our community. We're like, yeah! And one guy's like, we need to meet all the time. I'll, I'll speak. And I was just like, I'll... I'll create a chat channel. Mark Stanislav creates an IRC. And I'm like, people can come to my place. And it was awesome. And at the time, I was predominantly in a financial services firm, predominantly around building systems. And in my mind, security was good engineering practices, good coding practices. I'm like, this is great. I, I know as much as my four walls, right? That's pretty typical if you're an internal guy. I was having a dinner with a whole bunch of CIOs and CISOs in Phoenix last night, and we were all complaining about that, right? You know your box really well. You don't necessarily know what other people are doing in their boxes and how that transfers. So I'm like, this is great. I'll be able to bring people in who can give me insights. And of course, if you're a security person, we all know the budget we're working with, which is zero, and can you cut that? Preferably by next quarter. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't have much money, so I can have some smart people in, and they can give me advice. I'm like, this is fantastic. So all my set comes to my, my data center. I open it up. I'm badging people in. We're getting people coffee. We have some bagels. It's fantastic. We sit down. Josh Little, anyone take his uh, workshop the past couple days? Josh Little's workshop. Is he freaking awesome? Did you guys have a good time on that? I, I admire the heck out of that guy. He was the first guy to come to our data center and present. And he presented on um, web app bones. I think it was SQL injection probably. And, uh, and so he's presenting and everything. And pretty quickly people are like, oh, by the way, um, I just popped your Wi-Fi. I'm like, what? How did you even do that? Apparently, I didn't set it up right. Who knew? And the other person's like, oh, by the way, I'm on your network. I'm like, you could not be on my network. I've got NAC with a MAC address. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, we just, like, did you know that you could, like, 
you know, listen into a MAC address and I can just spoof a MAC address? I'm like, the hell you can. Change your MAC address off mine. And then someone else is telling me, and we had like these RFID keys and you had to like two man swipe and man trap. Like, oh yeah, by the way, I could probably like clone that RFID key. And that's about the time I'm like, this is not a good idea. I think this is a quick way for me to get fired. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to have my, so it was a really eye-opening experience. And part of the problem was, as an engineer, I went, how do I set up Wi-Fi? And I went online and said, here's how you do Wi-Fi. And guess what? Those instructions were vulnerable. They were known bad. How do I set up the door system? You went online, you talked to someone, and they set up the door system all the same way, right? And guess what? All those keys can be cloned. We all make the same mistakes over and over again. It's just kind of a monoculture that we argue about all the time, right? What if we have different, you know, diversity and everything else so that if we had a worm, it wouldn't spread? Well, we're really good at following design patterns in engineering and in software development. And if those design patterns lead to monoculture, it makes it very easy for the criminals or the curious <laughs> to come up with great ways to wormify it, make it repeatable, and go after us. And, uh, <clears throat> and we know that. We know that's a problem. Ah, excuse me. I will get through this without coughing into the microphone. That's my commitment to you guys. Um, and so we see this, right, in things like RDP. How many of us have RDP exposed over the internet? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to know. Don't, don't want anyone tell me. And uh, RDP, yeah, no, no. We're on camera. No, code of silence. But RDP, right, 2019-0708, one of the first times in my recollection that Microsoft went, you know what, I know we said we're not patching XP, but uh, we're patching XP. That is a problem, folks. This is a, a vulnerability that is quite likely going to be wormed. It's quite likely going to spread everywhere. And, uh, and the point is, is that RDP is always on port 3389, right? That's how you set up. So about RDP, we're going to open it up, and maybe we'll have people VPN or whatnot. Maybe we'll have this trusted network. I love the idea of the trusted network, which is conveniently behind the firewall, um, which is also where all your users are, all your other devices, guests, and everything else. Probably not that trusted. <clears throat> but we'll open it up to the trusted network, because we can, we can trust that. And that's where we'll run RDP. Now, one of the things I think is very interesting is if we do get wormed, and this worm spreads everywhere, um, what happens to people not running RDP on 3389? Probably not going to get whacked, right? Right away. Or it's going to force someone to do manual testing. Or it's going to be a worm that scans your entire port range, which will take forever. Most people who do just a little bit of tweaking, it's a great way to quickly break a bug or a worm. We usually don't think about that because, oh, security through obscurity, that's bad. We were taught that was bad. School, they said that was bad. We know that's not, we don't do that. But when we think about criminal hacking, it's often those same period of constraints. Here's the constraints. Here's how the environment is set up. And that, of course, pushes criminals to be better criminals. What can we do to make things more tricky? And we all know, we all know, we say this all the time, I'm on the defense side. I've got to be right every single time. But the criminals, they only need to be right once. We hear that all the time, right? It's kind of our cop-out whenever we miss something. Uh, <laughs> Verizon Data Breach Report finally has stats on this, and it made me so happy. It looks like something like this. Let me walk you through this. This is how likely attack is to succeed. As you can see, it falls down. One, two steps, they win, we lose. The more steps it takes, the harder it is to do it. If you can shift an attacker from one step to win, to five steps to win, their chance of succeeding has now dropped to about 50%. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, for years we've been like, oh, well, we no, they need to be right every single time for every single step that we put in their way, plus avoid our detection. If we make them port scan and guess, how likely are we to catch them then, right? Make it more noisy, and then they can win. It's really quite a fascinating flip on the common way of thinking about things. And it's also an interesting way again, to use human-centric design. Because in human-centric design for usability, it's all about making it nice and reducing friction. Human-centric design for defensibility is about making an inhuman nightmare for the criminals. How can we make it so hard and so complicated and so convoluted that they have to do 5, 10, 15, 20 steps to get in? Because when they do, we know we're going to stop them, be able to catch them, and crack it. And there's been some great stories over the years about this. People who have done... Um, honey pots, right? People who've done SQL instances that have wasted criminals' times, for instance, um, 
I love, again, different ports on different areas, changing things a little bit so that uh, there's enough security through obscurity that people get distracted, confused, and be muddled, which gives us an opportunity to catch them. And if it's malware, it gives us an opportunity to break that malware. I used to run all my servers back in the day, my Metaframe servers, on the M drive, which was freaking awesome because all the malware back then in the day was written for the C drive, and it would crash, and we get infected all the time. I mean, no, uh, no. But theoretically, we might have been infected a few times, and the malware would always break because we're in a different drive. It was a fantastic way of doing things. So a couple examples of this. This one will no longer work, but it's one of my favorite stories. Um, this was a MySec person. She discovered and backtrack, of course, had the uh, default username root and tor, right? Root and tor was how it was built, and you could SSH into it. And also, kind of cool, is if you booted onto the backtrack CD, it had a predefined signature that you could detect very easily on the network. So she noticed and she wrote a script that would detect it on the network whenever a backtrack machine was plugged in and would immediately SSH into it and shut it down. And so pen testers would come up and they'd, oh, I'm going to pack your boxes. I'm going to flip the table. And they'd be like, why does it keep shutting down? And they'd go one day, two days, three days. And they'd be like, you know, four days into it. I can't figure it out. It was phenomenal. I love that. We can start messing around with these concepts to make it really difficult and frictionful. Frictionful? Full of friction. All right. Another example that I like is looking at indicators that wouldn't matter at all to our users. Because oftentimes, when we talk about that like pull between usability and defensibility, if we make it too easy for our users, it's too easy for the criminals. If we think about things like, um, like uh, throttling and, and thresholds and rate limits, we can start doing some cool things. Because, for example, no one should get, no user should get like 500 404s in a couple minutes. That's probably a mistake, right? It's probably someone scanning for a whole bunch of pages, maybe. Probably not a user typing things in. Or 500s. If you're getting a whole bunch of 500s real quick, it's probably Josh Little. No. <laughs> it's someone doing something you shouldn't, all right? So if we look for these things, I had a, a, a customer who wrote a very simple script that would threshold those. And if somebody happened in a minute, he had an Nginx firewall, and he would send a row to the Nginx firewall, and he'd block them for an hour. Because if it was a valid user, by the time they had a problem, and they called in a help desk ticket, and things happened, about an hour would go by, and by the time it was fixed itself. And he had thresholded both of those things. How much time does it usually take to fix these things versus how many times do we want to put things in? So we can start playing with these concepts of raising the level of difficulty and the friction for the attacker in ways like thresholds and alerts that don't raise the level of friction and difficulty for our users. So that's what we talk about when we're designing for defensibility. That's what we talk about when we're designing and balancing against those two constraints. Finally, manageability. Manageability is, of course, what the security operations team has to do. What we oftentimes have to do in the back end to make sure if something happens that we're jumping on it, that we're taking care of these things, that we're aware of the alerts, that we're on top of it, that we're patching systems and catching bones and doing threat intelligence and sharing information and doing vulnerability management, continuous monitoring and security orchestration and automation and identity access, did I miss anything? User behavior analytics and blockchain and big data, that we're doing all those things that we've got it all under control. Uh, a while ago, I was uh, doing a lot of threat modeling, and we put in place this control, uh, part of critical security controls, that basically said if folks were logging in to a disabled account, do an alert. Right? It's one of the critical security controls. It's been in there forever. If the account's disabled, no one should log in. And at the same time, I was running a, a SIM called IBM Curator. Now, IBM Curator was, was this glorious system that I had all sorts of alerts and threat and tell and blah, blah, blah. I was part of the Isaac, the FS Isaac, so we had all sorts of stuff popping up into it all the time. And what happened was we set up this uh, rule on a Thursday. On a Friday, one of the employees was let go. And she had a VPN at home, and she went home and tried the entire weekend to log in. Now, her password was disabled, her account was disabled. She just didn't get anywhere. But she generated tens of alerts, hundreds of alerts. And, uh, and the, so that was Thursday. I had Monday, Friday off. I had Monday off. I came back on Tuesday, and the council was just blown up. 
I'm like, why, guys, why aren't you looking at this? We're getting all these alerts, blah, blah, blah. Why, why, why are you not jumping in on this? Security 101, respond to the alerts. And you know what they said to me? They said, I just figure it's Wolf doing what Wolf does. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, you're always doing crazy stuff, and then there's alerts, and everyone runs. So I wasn't really paying, I'm like, ugh. So I had a serious talk with them about mm, paying attention to alerts and everything. But when I was out at IC Squared, I was uh, with uh, Cooper, right? We were having this conversation. Yeah, you can hide. Uh, we were having this conversation. I don't remember who it was. It was someone when I was talking, telling the story, and they raised their hand. And I'm like, yeah, but uh, Wolf, what were you doing about alert fatigue? <laughs> I was like backing away slowly. I'm like, no, but it was their fault. <laughs> You're missing the point of the story. It wasn't my fault. It was their fault. They didn't check. What were we doing about alert fatigue? I had a, like a two-man team reviewing these logs, and I'm throwing like hundreds of alerts at them a day. That's a hell of a lot of alert fatigue, right? Of course, you're just right-clicking, closing it all, figuring I was doing something stupid. So when we start thinking about manageability, we also have to think about the cognitive load and the friction we're introducing in the security team who is responsible for looking at these things. And this becomes increasingly important when we think about the way I have defined security over the past couple years, which is not castle walls, not high uh, strong doors, right? It's bells on strings, bells on strings across the environment that ring whenever an attacker is moving through. Again, if we can get them down to five, 10 steps, we have a great deal of success in detecting and stopping them as shown by the Verizon Data Breach Report. So if we can get them to do that, we're in a really good spot. But if we get them to do that, that means lots and lots of alerts. So somehow we need to balance these things and have take into account the alert fatigue, going back to being um, empathetic and kind not only to our users, but to also our security professionals. Going back and looking at these design principles and applying them in a positive way to the folks who are now responsible for managing this morass of a security environment that we've created uh, for most organizations. The two I want to look at is alignment and unity. Alignment is communicating the positioning of information and actions, right? Alignment is how are your security tools aligned? How are they feeding from one to another? How are they presenting a common view? Uh, oftentimes, when I look at something as simple as threat and hunting with a phishing email, what do you do with that? You copy the email that was put in the ticket, you copy it down, you throw it up into another tool, you pull out the MD5 signature, you put it in another tool that looks, and then you look at the header for the IP address, and you throw that into your blacklist, right? And you're, by the next time you're in like 10 different systems, you're copying and pasting, trying to create mentally some model of what you're, you're doing, what the user's happening. It's really, really kludgy when you think about what we ask a lot of security professionals to do. Uh, Unity is another one. Unity is how all those elements come together, right? Can we pull out APIs and have a lot of this automated and orchestrated. Can we look at SOAR technology and that orchestration to say, okay, if this comes in, follow this pipeline and present us a common view. Can we reduce the amount of alerts that we're responding to? Still keep them so we can dig into it, but reduce it down. This is called the double diamond model of design. Now, we just had the threat intelligence talking here, which has the diamond model. This is not the diamond model of threat intelligence. This is the double diamond model. Double is good. It has nothing to do with threat intelligence. But Exactly, right? Two is always better than one. When you're doing design, and this follows for cybersecurity, you start with ha having any idea of what's going on. And you explore a whole bunch of alternatives until you converge on what you think the problem is. And you explore a bunch of alternatives until you converge on what you think the solution is, right? That is how we oftentimes go about doing cybersecurity. The challenge is, with so many tools, you get about right here, and then you think it's something else, you go back to there. You get over here, you think you have a good problem statement, because you think it's just a fish, and really it's a determined attacker. And then you're way off in the weeds over here. Or you get about right up to here, and then it's like something funny on Twitter, and you got to retweet it. And then you go get some coffee. <laughs> it's crazy. So I think design theory, too, industrial design, offers us some really cool stuff that we can use and leverage to try and figure out the best way to put in place those tools so that we can look at the workflow, the experience of those incident providers, and try and design something better. I mean, think of this like the artist formerly known as CISO, right? What do you do? We design for the experience of the security team. We prioritize preparation over prevention detection. That was another tweet that I tweeted that no one liked. So here's the thing about that. 
uh, we've been really good since Winch War II and the 1990s to say prevention, detection, to security, right? We prevent, we detect. That's awesome. And what that trained a lot of CISOs and directors is to go, before you talk to me about your product, tell me how it drives prevention, detection. Because by golly, I read Gartner and I know I'm supposed to ask that, right? <laughs> we do this again and again. So <clears throat> the challenge of that is good prevention and detection is very, very tactical. And what happens right now? Right now, when something happens, all the information we do, we do the double diamond and we try and work through the thing. Preparation, the practice, the um, analysis, the workflow, right? The gamification. Preparation is something that we oftentimes completely overlook because it's not in a Forrester Wave, it's not in a Gartner product, and we don't necessarily know how to build that in. I think because of that, we're so focused on prevention detection that preparation, the one thing that we could do strategically, is overlooked. If we're focused on prevention and detection and preparation, we're adding a lot of controls. And I would say, for security teams right now, for every single addition, there needs to be subtraction. Every time I add a tool or a technique or an alert, we need to be taking away a tool, a technique, or an alert. Not gone. We may still need it but something that is managed and adding cognitive overhead, every time we add something, take something away. So we can be kind and compassionate towards our InfoSec professionals and as well as enabling them to be very good. So what does that look like in practice? Uh, there is a guy up in Michigan who runs IBM Q Radar, and I really admire the heck out of this guy. <laughs> he's so cool. And he's got this great security operations center. It's everything I ever wanted. It's got raised floors and cameras and all that. It's, it's fantastic. And uh, he gets attacked all the time. I mean, hundreds of times a day. They're running through these workflows, trying to do all these things. And uh, what's fascinating is on their wall, their main wall, right, all these people sitting at the desk staring at this main wall. It's not a pew pew map. It's not threat intelligence by Twitter. Uh, does that ever really work? We're arguing about that in the hallway. Threat intelligence by Twitter, right? How do I get threat intelligence? I stay on top of Twitter and I look at cat pictures. Um, no, what he has is he's built a dashboard that looks something like this. It's engine lights. He's got eight different categories, and those categories all have alerts. High volumes, certain types of alarms, certain types of conditions. And if you look and it's blank, we're good, we're green, and if things start lighting up, they know to change the priority and focus of certain teams in the Security Operations Center. Everything has been simplified down to that point. Now, if the engine light comes on, you better believe they're going to pull over, pull a couple guys off, deep dive into the alerts and figure out what's going on. But isn't that much better than throwing 200, 300, 400 alerts at them every single day? It's really a different way of doing things, a much more simplified way of doing things. And in addition to this, what his team does, back to preparation, is they do quarterly exercises. They look at what's recently been happening in their environment. They look at what's common as their threats. They look at some of their peers and what's going on there. And they say, hey, great. Let's all get in the room. Let's talk through this. And let's figure out what would happen if that happened here. And oh, by the way, you would, do, you would use that tool? Show me that tool. Oh, well, that's awesome. You would contain it with the Cisco switch. Do you know what those commands are? Do we have those things written down? Right? <laughs> and they talk through all these things. And they refresh the run books. And they're very, very careful with adding anything. If they add anything, they want to make sure it's uh, data driven and supported by facts. And ideally, that's replacing something else. Really well designed, well thought out, empathetic way of running a security operations center. All right. So, in conclusion, this is about design. This is about thinking about the environment and experiences we provide people through the lens of industrial design, through the lens of UI, UX. It's about saying that security ultimately depends on empathy. We need to be kind. We need to be kind. And we forget that. We so forget that. Because I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in the day and age of hackers and IT and hack the Gibson and configure the technology, and the users are stupid, and mom and dad don't understand email, and Usenet's pretty cool, and I just learned how to do something awesome, and I can get root and tour if I can write some software and rummage through the garbage. This was a great time in the 90s. It was fun. It was not an empathetic time. And when we think about how security has evolved, it's not necessarily evolved to think about the experiences that we're delivering to our users and to our management. And then the fun is, 
to the bad guys where we make it incredibly inhumane and bad for them. The way to do this is to think about things in those combinations. How are we making it simple for those groups and hard for those groups? And saying that IT does not have to be mechanical, does not have to be technical. It is a mechanical art as a technical art, and much the same as painting and sculpture and all the other things that we go into design. There's this great series on Netflix I encourage you guys to watch if you're interested in this concept called Abstract. And I watched an hour of a guy designing a Nike shoe. I don't like Nike shoes. Those Air Jordans. I'm not really into basketball. But it was fantastic, the amount of craftsmanship and the mechanical art that he had to do to build these shoes. And all that just gets subsumed in this you know, design and this experience for you know, Michael Jordan and for everyone about the shoes. Ultimately, IT does not have to be mechanical. It does not have to be utilitarian. It can be creative. IT security can be very creative. It can be very artistic. It can be a way for self-expression, and it can be fundamentally marvelous. We create phenomenal experiences for our end users and for those responsible for defending folks for making the human mistakes that all too often we make that lead to security concerns. I think we have uh, a moral obligation, right, to our users and our peers. I think we, we have a need to design better experiences, to design better controls. And I think it's an area that's rife for plumbing. And I would highly encourage you guys, if you're interested, to check out abstract and other design theories. And uh, hit me up over um, email or on the web if you want to talk further. Thank you very much. Do you want me to do Q&A? You can stop the video. Everything else is off the record.